Hey everybody, it's David Urjabian, and I know you missed me last year. I hope that you did, but I'm back. Sorry I wasn't here last week. Things are a little different this year, as we all know. I was kind of looking forward to standing up on the stage and seeing everybody like we normally do, but we're not going to do that this year. But still, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're able to stay home in your stocking feet and your shorts or whatever, your pajamas or whatever you have on, but we're just glad you're watching. Uh, the summer's a little bit shorter with our reviews, uh, but we've still got a bunch of good ones, and uh, we're looking forward to you being here every week, and uh, I'll see you before uh, everyone as well. So tonight we've got a great speaker, Tracy Walder, and I'm going to now turn it over to Richard to introduce her, and I will see you at the end of the uh, review. It's really a joy to introduce uh, Tracy Walder. Uh, I've heard Tracy before. She has an amazing story to tell. Tracy is a, uh, a graduate of the University of Southern California, uh, and she got her master's degree at Chapman University. Uh, today, she is a, an adjunct professor of criminal justice at TCU. But it's what happened in between that makes all the difference in the world. This is going to be a fabulous story of a young lady out of college who becomes CIA, who then becomes FBI, who deals in a lot of kind of places that are very dangerous places to be. And she's going to tell us a rip-roaring personal story uh, that's set out in her book, The Unexpected Spy. In fact, the tagline from the book is, From the CIA to the FBI, My Secret Life Taking Down Some of the World's Most Notorious Terrorists. Uh, the Unexpected Spy has been an unexpected success also because uh, uh, it, is a, it is an audiobook bestseller. Uh, Tracy has spoken, uh, she's spoken to uh, Good Morning America. She has uh, spoken to Fox News. Uh, she's done security pieces for Huffington Post, for New York Post. Uh, now there's a lot she's going to tell you, but of course there's a lot she can't tell you. The fun part of this book is you'll see that certain sections are redacted because uh, they tell too much. So she's going to tell you what she can tell you, uh, and it's going to be quite a story. So please welcome the unexpected spy, Tracy Walder. Hi, I'm Tracy Walder, the author of The Unexpected Spy. First, I wanted to give a big thank you to the Rajabian family. I'm really excited to be a part of this series, and I appreciate them having me on to tell my story. So to give you a little bit of background of who I am and what my story is about, um, I thought I would start at the beginning. Um, I was born in, in California, um, and at the time I was born with a disease that a lot of people didn't know anything about, and they still don't know anything, well, not a whole lot about it. Um, it's called hypotonia. Um, my parents really didn't know what was wrong with me when I was born. Um, I didn't hold my head up. Uh, I was missing a lot of sort of those baby milestones that a lot of, a lot of newborns have. Um, and when I was about eight or nine months old, my mom finally, you know, kind of urged the doctor to take a, a deeper look into what was going on with me. I um, wasn't trying to sit up. I wasn't trying to hold my head up. I kind of had some swallowing issues. Um, and they, at that time, diagnosed me with something called hypotonia, which means basically no mus low muscle tone. Um, and people can have this in, in all varying different degrees. Um, there are some that need to be fed, unfortunately, through a feeding tube, and then there's others that are sort of like me that uh, missed kind of developmental milestones and, and lagged physically, um, but had a, a decent sort of outcome in life. Um, and the doctor at that time, uh, my mom told me this story later, had said, well, she's never going to be a dancer, she's never going to be a runner, she's never going to be athletic, but she'll get by. Um, and, you know, I think in the 70s, they didn't have, you know, things like physical therapy every day and those kinds of interventions that I think maybe would have been different now. Um, and so, you know, my mom and dad sort of had to make those interventions themselves. And a lot of it really fell to my mom. Um, my father was a professor and so he was, was working some crazy hours. And my mom decided that she was gonna enroll me in, in dance class, even though I couldn't stand up and couldn't walk. Uh, she would go with me and, and sort of hold me up. Um, 
you know, under my arms and help me, help me stand up. Um, I did ballet, I did jazz. Um, I think they tried tap with me. Um, I wasn't sturdy enough on my feet to, to stand. Um, and I, I actually do remember being pretty young and I'm just constantly falling down. I couldn't walk in, ta in tap shoes. Um, so tap I never did, but I did all of the other sort of dance forms. Um, and I think my mom and dad's attitude about that and about what I had was very much like, this is what you have. We can either work with it and help you be successful or, you know, you can sit around and sort of wallow um, in it. And so for me, um, they never really put me in sports. I think they were concerned that they couldn't do that with me. So I never really adopted sports. Um, but I think I got my, a degree of tenacity uh, from my parents from that. Um, so that's really sort of how my, my life started out. Um, I you know, was born and raised in a suburb in California. I had a pretty normal, stable life. Um, but I think my parents were always sort of news junkies. I grew up with the news always on. I really don't remember the station that was always on, but I grew up with the news always on. Um, and so I remember asking a lot of questions about the world. Um, and particularly, I think at that time, there was a lot of unrest and instability going on in the Middle East. And so I think for me, I just had a lot of questions and I had great parents in the sense that they never really gave me uh, biased answers. Um, they just gave me sort of open-ended answers and uh, wanted me to form my own opinions about these situations. So I think for me, that's where my interest um, in the world really came from at a, at a very early age. Um, and really that started as early in, that I can remember as in first or second grade. Um, another thing that sort of shaped my experience growing up is you know, I had, a, I had friends, um, but I can explicitly remember in the third grade, um, that was really when the bullying started. And um, the bullying was, was horrendous. It was physical, it was mental, it was emotional, it was everything, to the point that teachers and principals were calling home, suspending kids, um, and the bullying really never let up. Um, uh, to this day, my family and I, I ask my mom constantly, you know, why? Do you remember why? Nobody remembers why. Um, I think it was just kids choosing an easy victim. Um, and I was that, that victim. Um, I, my teachers were pretty supportive. Um, but unfortunately, I think when you're bullied for that long, um, during those formative years of life, it does have an impact, um, I think, of the, on the adult that you grow up to be. I don't define myself um, you know, by the bullying, but I do think it has a mark on my personality. Um, and so for me, the mark that it left on me was a, a degree of independence. Um, I started to find solace in, in myself um, because obviously I couldn't get it from other places. Uh, you know, back then we did not have social media and thank goodness and all of those kinds of things. So for me, my home became like a safe place um, because I would go home and I knew that there was no one there to, to bully me. The bullying would stop um, when I left school for the day. Um, and so, you know, I just, I dealt with it, but I sort of with, withdrew a little bit. Um, and so that was sort of another event that I guess shaped me. I still had that interest in the world and when i was in sixth grade i we, that was when we sort of started to learn about i'm from california california history um american history and i started becoming very interested in history so my dad would give me um there's author jeff shahara books um on the civil war and just sort of would throw those at me um, which i know that they're a little mature but he knew i liked them so i would read them i just became very interested in history um and I thought, oh, well, maybe this is something I could do. I had some really great history teachers. Maybe I'll be a high school history teacher. Um, and to the point that in 11th grade, I had a teacher who really made American history just come alive for me. Um, and I, I became almost sort of mesmerized by it. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted to do something with that. I just wasn't sure you know, what I wanted to do. 
also, again, I still had that, that world interest. Um, I, was, I grew up very fortunate um, in that, much to my chagrin at the time, my parents didn't believe in giving us presents for you know, holidays, birthdays, those kinds of things. Um, they took us overseas. So you know, we would go to Europe or Latin America, which obviously I know I'm incredibly lucky to have those opportunities, but I think when you're 12 and 13 and 14, you don't want to be away for three weeks <laughs> during the summer. You want to be with your friends. Um, but I do think that left a huge mark on me um, and my curiosity. Uh, about the world. And so for me, I decided to go to USC. I really did not apply to that many colleges. Again, this was a different time, but that's where my dad was a professor. So I know I knew that I was going to get uh, free tuition there. So I didn't have too many options um, in terms of college, but USC was a great option uh, and I, I, I loved it. And I decided to major in history there, but I made a very critical I guess, a critical decision in my life. Um, and what I decided was I didn't want to just focus on American history because I could have gotten my degree in American history. Um, I wanted to just broadly major in history because that meant that I had to take, I could take Middle Eastern history classes. I could take Russian history classes. I had to sort of check different boxes of the world's history classes. Um, and so that, again, sort of stoked my passion um, in the world. And I had a class, uh, Intro to Economics, my freshman year, that was, it was hard. It was really hard <laughs> for me. It was not an easy class. Um, and my teacher was actually the dean of the entire Letters, Arts, and, Co um, and Sciences College at USC. And he was really great. You know, when you were struggling, he would help you. He was, he was a great professor. And so I went to his office hours because I definitely needed help. Um, and one of the things he said to me was, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to be? And I thought, a high school history teacher. That's what I'll do with this. That's what you do with a, high school, with a history degree. And I had that teacher who I know I really really made history come alive for me in, in 11th grade. And he said, but you know, there's other applications of a history degree. It doesn't just fit in that sort of narrow um, scope. And I said, well, what do you mean? I thought that that's what I do. And he's like, no, no, you should look at other opportunities. Intern at a museum, intern, you know, in a political office, look at other opportunities. So um, throughout sort of my time, um, I interned at uh, LA's Museum of Natural History and I was, you know, cataloging battlefield uniforms from the Revolutionary War and I mean, that was just an amazing opportunity. Um, I studied abroad, but what that was at USC was um, you would go to Washington DC and you interned for either, you know, a congressman, a senator. And so I got to do that and that was fascinating too. And I started thinking, wow, there's, there's a lot of things that I could do with this degree. Um, and so how I got to the CIA um, was I, USC has a main thoroughfare, just like a lot of campuses do. Um, I believe SMU has like Bishop Boulevard. Uh, USC has something called Truesdale Parkway. Um, and I've come to find out they still do recruitment fairs on Truesdale Parkway, but that's the main thoroughfare. So if you're looking you know, for jobs or different offices that come, that's where they come and recruit um, on certain days. And my college roommate, um, this was back in the day when um, there was a company called Arthur Anderson. Um, everyone wanted to, to sort of work there. This was kind of the latish 90s. And um, she said that she was going to go and drop off her resume there and I should come with her too since I was kind of on this quest to experience different things. Um, and I believe it was about a month before I had sat in my room in my sorority house watching this person who later I found to be known as Peter Bergen and, and his partner Peter Arnett interview this guy and this guy was Osama bin Laden and that turned out to be really the first and only time that he had ever been interviewed um, by an American news team and for some reason I, I was very taken in 
a bad way um, by him and that I didn't understand. That was when he actually declared war on the United States. I didn't understand who he was. I didn't understand why he hated us so much. I mean, we have to remember this was a different world to you politically, you know, in, in 1997, which is when that, that interview was. And so, you know, terrorism wasn't top of mind, sort of front center for folks. We had just had Oklahoma City, um, but that was a different kind of terrorism um, than what we saw later. And so I just became very interested in the Middle East. Like, what is this? Um, what, what is this person? Where did this come from? Where did his views on America come from? Um, and so I thought, well, but I don't really know how to do that. How do I do terrorism? How do I work terrorism? I think, you know, I didn't, didn't know how to apply that. Um, so I went to this career fair and um, there was a table that said CIA. I had no preconceived notions of the CIA, and I think that that worked really well to my advantage. I think now, um, you know, you've got shows like Homeland or Criminal Minds or all these different pop culture shows. I mean, people expect it to be sort of a certain way. For me, um, I don't even think there was a new James Bond yet uh, when I was in, in college. I think uh, Sean Connery was still the, the old James Bond. So I had no preconceived notions of of what I was going to do there and what that was going to be like. Um, and so I gave, I remember giving my recruiter um, my resume and saying, I'm, I'm just a history major. I don't, like, I don't really think you want me, but like, I mean, I'm gonna give you my resume anyways. And I remember him saying, oh no, there's a lot of things a history major can do there. And I said, okay. And I just, I didn't really give it too many more thoughts after that. I just kind of peddled my way off to my astronomy class. Um, I don't think I thought any more about what I was doing. Um, and so about two or three weeks later, the phone rang in my room in my sorority house and I, I was sitting on beanbag chair studying and my roommate, it, it, it ended up being the, the recruiter who was at that recruitment fair. And he said, you know, we like you, we want to bring you for an interview. I mean, I think at that point, I didn't give it much thought. I've, I've sort of always been a person of, you know, why, why not? Why not just try it? You know, just like I tried um, working at LA's Museum of Natural History and I loved it. I tried, you know, working for a senator and I loved it. You know, why would this be any, why would I not love this too? Um, and I thought for me, you know, teaching, and I don't mean this to sound bad, but the ability to become a teacher would probably always be there. I would always have my history degree. Um, but I always thought that working at the CIA would make me a better teacher because I would have a practical application of the history that I was teaching. Um, and I think in the long run it did. It made me a better teacher. Um, so I, I went for the interview. Um, I must have passed that uh, because I received a, a schedule um, to go. They, they fly you out to the D.C. area to do sort of the big big um, stuff, which is the polygraph exam, the physical um, exam, sort of some cognitive exams, and then kind of some academic critical thinking type of, of things um, as well. Um, I don't remember thinking too much about it. The, the, the hardest part for me was, was the polygraph. That was a really uh, difficult experience. And um, I, I talk about it a lot in my book, so I'm, I'm gonna let you read my book if you wanna hear about my, my polygraph experience because it was, um, it was uh, quite, quite the situation. It was uh, eight hours one day and eight hours another day. So it's nothing like what you see on TV. Um, and so, you know, I was so young, I was only 20, um, that my mom actually accompanied me, um, obviously not to the polygraph exam, but, but on the trip, she stayed with me in my hotel room um, and those, those kinds of things. So um, it was a, a really great, um, it, well, it wasn't the best experience. I did call my recruiter and threaten to not keep going on anymore after the polygraph exam, but that which doesn't kill you makes you a lot stronger. <laughs> so I, I passed that part. Um, and then that's when they do sort of that really big background check on you. Um, and for me, it was interesting because my background investigator, most of who conducts those are folks that are probably, you know, retired Secret Service, retired um, Defense Intelligence Agency folks who uh, lived at the time I was in LA. Um, and so the gentleman was in his 80s um, and he had to come to my sorority house 
uh, during what we call rush, well now it's called recruitment week, but during rush practice week. So he had uh, over 200 girls screaming, uh, singing rush songs uh, while he was waiting to talk to me uh, and interview me and interview my friends. I really didn't think I was gonna pass at that point uh, simply because it was quite the uh, interesting situation. But, but I did, I moved through the background process very, very quickly. Um, and a lot of that's because I was really young. I didn't have a lot of baggage, um, I guess, that you know someone older may have. So with the CIA, you don't necessarily get to say, you know, I want to go and work this. That, that's not how it works. Um, your place where they put you. And so for me, I got lucky um, in that I got, I got to work in counterterrorism really right off the bat. And that's not because I was awesome. Um, it was because at that time, terrorism wasn't a big deal. Um, really, the seasoned folks um, were working in our Latin America uh, counter narcotics branch or our Russia branch. Um, that was sort of where the really experienced folks were going. Um, and I was not, you know, put in the directorate of analysis. And that's because I, I didn't have a PhD or a master's in. Um, you know, South Korean politics. Um, I had a broad degree. And so for me, the best place for me was in operations. So I was placed in the Directorate of Operations. Um, and my first job at the agency was um, looking at terrorist training camps, you know, who was coming and going from them, um, how many people were there at a time, what it, it, identifying new camps, um, identifying weapons that they might have at those camps. And so I did that and I really enjoyed it uh, for a really uh, I did that for about a year, um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoyed the people that I was working with. Um, and uh, in the like the middle of August of 2001, um, I was told that I was needed to go to a meeting in about two weeks. And at that meeting, I was going to be what's called read into, which means um, given a different security compartment um, to work another program. And it was just three of us. On it was two two of my male colleagues and then myself. I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> why not? Why not? Um, and so um, the first week of September in 2001, I was, I was right into that program. And I think that was the first time that I thought, is anyone going to die um, from me doing this? I, I didn't know if that was something that I was comfortable with. And I remember asking my boss, um, I remember saying, you know, is, is anyone, are we going to have to kill anyone? I just, I didn't know, you know, how I felt about that. And he's like, oh, no, 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 not unless there's a really large terrorist attack. And then obviously September 11th happened. Um, and so, you know, that was an interesting day. Um, I was at CIA headquarters. Um, I did not know that the first plane had hit. Um, so I got into work between 6 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. I, I, I just, I like to go to work early. That's just, the, I've always been a morning person. That's what I did. So this was obviously hours before um, the attack had happened. So at CIA, you know, you don't get to bring your cell phone in um, and you don't have access to open internet. You actually have to go to special rooms to access open internet. So the, you don't necessarily know that these events are happening in like real time. And so for me, um, I got a call, you have two phone lines. One's a black line and one's a red line. So one's secure, one's unsecure. And I got a call on my unsecure phone from a friend who was working at a different outbuilding telling me to turn on like my closed circuit TV. Um, and so I turned it on just in time to see the second plane, you know, hit the World Trade Center. And I think at that moment, I knew this was a terrorist attack of some sort. Um, and so there was a lot of, not confusion, there was a lot of what I call door closing at that point, which means, you know, if you're just kind of a lowly employee like I was, you work in like a cubicle bay um, and, you know, all your, your superiors work, you know, in little offices and a lot of their doors closed um, at that moment. So we were all just sort of hanging around wondering what we were going to do. Um, we, the agency was evacuated, obviously we stayed. Um, and then the people that were to work on the program that I was working on, um, we were released maybe 1 a.m., 2 a.m. that same day. Um, we were released to go home and then we had to come back um, the next day. And so really from September 12th to probably the middle of January 2002, um, you know, I was working 18 or 20 hour days on that um, specific program. Um, and it really was 
it wasn't trial by fire because we knew what we were doing. We had been monitoring things for a long time. But, you know, this was something very, very new um, that we were using. And so, I mean, George Tennant at the time, who was the head of the CIA, was in there every single day um, with us. He'd bring us donuts. He brought us Thanksgiving dinner, um, you know, Christmas dinner, although we didn't get any, you know, holidays off. Um, members of the administration were always in there almost every day. Um, and it's this teeny tiny room. So, you know, they're constantly um, over you. And, you know, it was really... A, amazing to see the inner workings of leadership at that time. It was remarkable. I think for me being so young, um, being able to see that, it was, it, it was for me awe-inspiring um, to be able to work in that kind of an environment um, and to have somewhat respect, you know, from, from leaders at that time. It was, it was great. Um, I was working on the program um, the night that we lost um, Osama bin Laden in a place called Tora Bora. And I detail that um, in a couple chapters in my book. Um, and that was a really difficult day because it sort of felt like all the air came out of what we called the vaults, which is where we worked um, at that moment. Um, and it was, it was really, really, really difficult. Um, in the middle of January, we were all rotated off of that program, not because we had done a bad job, um, but because of the intensity at the work, of the work. Tennant had decided that he wanted people to basically do four or five months on and then four or five months off, um, which made total sense. Um, and so I was placed in a group called the Counterterrorism Center's Weapons of Mass Destruction group. Um, and what our goal or our, our purpose um, was to monitor Al-Qaeda's acquisition of weapons of mass destruction. So my target uh, was an individual who is called Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Um, he is the founder of ISIS um, and he was killed in a drone strike in 2006. Um, but he, people don't know sort of about his life before ISIS. Um, this would have been before ISIS. Um, he and bin Laden didn't get, a, get along too well. They didn't like each other. Um, and bin Laden said, you know what? You go ahead and be my WMD acquisitions guy. I don't really want to deal with you a whole lot. And so that's why we had to follow him. Um, I did not follow nukes. Um, I followed more like crude toxins and, and poisons. Um, and um, it was a really interesting job. They sent me to poison school. Um, uh, you know, I was supposed to have gone to the farm for five months, but because September 11th had happened, they suspended a lot of our training uh, because they needed us to be really nimble and able to, I mean, we had background already on it and they needed us to be able to do things. So I would have my training sort of peppered in, um, you know, so I would spend three weeks in a class called Crash and Bang, which is where you learn how to crash cars and blow things up, which was, I guess, it was actually pretty fun for me. Um, I don't know if that's everyone's idea of fun. Um, you learn how to shoot all different types of weapons, um, Russian weapons. Um, uh, they just want you to be familiar with different weapons types, um, surveillance training, all those kinds of things. But I would take it in like different chunks kind of along the way. Um, and so really that's what I became sort of obsessed with. And most of the, the networks we were breaking up um, and the, the attacks that we were able to stop were in, in Europe. Um, that's where a lot of the attacks were. Um, but a lot of the networks had their hubs um, in the Middle East and in sort of the North Africa region. Um, so that's where I took a lot of my, my travels. Um, I traveled to a lot of different countries. Unfortunately, um, the CIA will not allow me to share precisely where I've been. Um, uh, in my book, uh, there's sections, um, I don't know if I can show a little bit here, that have been um, redacted. So there's sections that the CIA um, redacted. Um, and this was actually what the book looks like after five different submissions to them. When you leave, you sign a non-disclosure agreement that you have to submit all materials to them. Um, to be looked at to make sure that they don't um, divulge national security. Um, so I came to find out that the biggest issue and the thing that was causing the most redactions uh, was that I was being too locational in the areas that I had ha was going to. I was titling chapters basically by the countries um, that I had visited. And um, I came to, to realize that I, 
every time I traveled, I traveled in an alias, so a completely different name, all of that. And theoretically, um, at the time I made a name with Chandler, so Tracy Chandler had never been to these countries. Um, and so that was a problem. I can't publish a book under my real name um, when I had never been to those countries under my real name. And I didn't realize that until probably by rewrite three <laughs> or four. I wish I had realized that earlier. The problem is the CIA, when you submit, um, they will not tell you why they've redacted. You have to guess. Um, and I appealed one of the chapters, and that was the Crash and Bang chapter. They had redacted the whole thing, um, but it's published in the book in full. So um, that was a fully redacted chapter. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things was the ability to travel and was the ability to, to see these different, different places. Um, I think for me, I was really young um, and I, I didn't have a sense of the world or sort of an understanding of the world. And one, it's not the most sexy chapter, but it's one of the more pivotal moments in terms of me realizing my place in the world um, was when I was at this uh, very large gathering of actually members of intelligence services uh, from all over the world. Um, and it was a dinner. <laughs> it's very fancy. And um, I was seated at a table and to my right um, was an individual from a country who at the time was really angry with us. And so he just wouldn't speak to me, like period, which I expected that. We did not have a good relationship with this country at the time. Um, but then the gentleman to my left, he, he spoke with me and that, and that was fine and he, he was great. But I didn't expect him being from the country that he's from um, to say something to me. And um, we, we were talking about September 11th. We were talking about, we were all there, you know, about terrorism. And he said to me, look, my country has been dealing with terrorists for, you know, 2000 years. He said, you know, your country has this one incident in one day and you expect us all to stop what we're doing and help you. And I think that really caused me to think about the world a little bit differently. Not that our country didn't deserve help, it absolutely did, but it just made me realize that lots of other different countries are experiencing lots of different things as well. And it really kind of took me out of my bubble, I guess, which for me, that was a really good thing. Um, and, you know, I had another experience. Um, I did participate, and I, I am surprised the CIA let me keep this in, but I did participate in um, debriefings of um, some terrorists. And I asked one terrorist who wasn't much older than I, I don't believe, I asked him, I said, you know, why did you become a terrorist? I was, I know that sounds like a basic question, but it's something that I could never understand from my life of, of privilege and my life of normalcy, um, sort of why he did what he did. And his answer to me was, you know, my both of his parents left um, when he was five or six. Um, he grew up living in the sewers of the country that he was from. He had hepatitis. He was starving. He really had just been to kindergarten, and that was it. Um, and his country, where well, Al-Qaeda happened to be prevalent, um, members of Al-Qaeda took him in, fed him, made sure he got his hepatitis medication, uh, sent him to school. Um, and I don't want to say it made sense because I don't know that I'm ever going to understand, you know, why people are terrorists. But it made me also realize that if we want to get to the root of this problem, um, it runs a lot deeper sometimes than what we see um, in that we need to fix the problems of some of these countries that folks are coming from where their basic needs sort of aren't being met and Al-Qaeda can kind of swoop in and meet those basic needs. Um, and so that was also sort of a, a pivotal um, moment for me um, as well. I did not have too many issues being a female um, in a lot of these countries. There's one country I talk about in my book where it was interesting feeling like a complete outsider and not able to hide my skin color, my eye color, my hair color. Um, it was an uncomfortableness that I'm glad I was able to experience um, in that people were hanging from the trees to try to touch my hair. Uh, people were, even though I covered, um, it was still obvious <laughs> that I was American. Um, nobody was ever terrible to me um, and I never had an issue I think it was because I worked counterterrorism and I was legitimately trying to help these countries. 
I didn't have too many issues um, in working with my sources and my assets overseas um, because the reality was is I think everyone was scared. Um, everyone was scared of you know being the victim of the next terrorist attack. Um, and so as a result, I did not have too, too many issues. Um, and also even at the CIA, I didn't have too many issues uh, being a woman. So I'm extremely, extremely feminine. Um, you know, I have, would have sparkle everything on my cubicle. Um, I like to wear dresses. I like to wear pink. It's just who I am. And, you know, my division chief didn't care at all. I mean, he sent me overseas into war zones. Like, the, I could truly just be myself, and I was fine with them because I got, I got my work done, and I got my job done, and I was always sort of professional um, about it. Um, and I, so I think for me, um, I never felt hindered. Um, you know, being a woman and being feminine um, there. And I never thought that it was something that I couldn't do because I think, you know, I was told I wouldn't walk. I was told I wouldn't dance. I was told I wouldn't do all those things and I did them. So why not, you know, make a go, I guess, um, at this. And I, I loved um, my time at the agency. I won a lot of awards um, when I was there and I'm still really great friends with a lot of people there. We talk almost every day. Um, but I think for me, um, after about four or five years, I became very burned out. Uh, you know, September 11th, that, that was a lot. And that's a lot to deal with when you're young and working in the counterterrorism center. And I think for me, I realized too, just looking around me, that I was never going to have sort of the life that I ultimately wanted. I, I remember, I went to college to be a high school history teacher, thinking that my experiences at the CIA would just would make me a better teacher. Um, and so for me, um, I, I sort of needed to be rooted more in one place. I was traveling a lot all the time, um, and I was never really in one place. And I think who the agency is at its core with the traveling, it, that's never gonna change. That's who they are, and that's okay. They should stay that way. And so I made sort of a painful heart. It's, it's always hard to leave a place when you're happy. Uh, but I made a decision that, you know, I need to, to put down roots somewhere and feel like I have more roots. So I decided, okay, I'm going to leave the agency, but I think I would like to become a special agent at the FBI. I realize that sounds like a jump, but for me, I was still very passionate about the counterterrorism mission. And I wasn't necessarily willing to sort of give that up. And I knew that because of September 11th, the FBI had you know terrorism task force and things like that 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 they were you know working with and so i thought okay i could work counterterrorism as a special agent there but i would be assigned to sort of one field office if i picked a big one i knew i would be there forever because you don't have to rotate out um, and so that was my reasoning and so i left and it was really hard i cried the day that i left i know a lot of people want to think that i was pushed out or fired or this or that and, and I wasn't. I, I just talked to my old division chief about a month ago um, you know, about leaving and how he was sad and I was sad. It was, it was sad. Um, but I knew I was making it for the right reasons. I wasn't leaving because I was unhappy. I was leaving because there was something fundamental about the agency that was never, ever going to change. And that's okay. Um, and so I had already begun you know, the process while I was still at the agency. And I think I, I left on a Friday. I think I reported to Quantico on a Monday. Um, and so I reported to Quantico, which is the FBI Academy. Um, for me, um, being there was a big deal because I, I passed the physical fitness test. Um, and so you have to remember that I was born um, with hypotonia, which I, I still have. Um, it doesn't go away necessarily. And I was able to train myself um, to pass the PT test. You have to pass one PT test in order to go through to Quantico. And so I did, and that was, that was a really big deal um, for me. So I, so I drove down to Quantico, packed up my apartment and drove down to Quantico um, and started uh, in my new agent class. And I was really excited. Um, I had no reason to not be excited. I thought it would be just like the CIA, um, which I think was naive on my part. The FBI and CIA are two totally different organizations with two totally different missions. The CIA collects intelligence and analyzes it. That's that's what they do, and that's their mission. The FBI is a law enforcement organization. Those are two very different 
uh, missions. I'm not sure I fully understood that uh, when I started. And so I started, um, there's 40 people in each new agent class. Um, and so in my class, there were 34 uh, males and six females, which for me, I know that seems like a big deal, but you have to remember, I was very used to being in environments where I was the only female. I was in war zones and things. It, it didn't bother me all that much. It was like, I guess, expected almost at the time. Um, and so I was the youngest in my class by far. Um, most of the agents, their average age or new agents was like about 34-ish. Um, and at the time I was like 26. Um, so I was definitely the youngest. Um, and we had to kind of go around and talk about you know, who we were, where we were from, and you know what our jobs were before. And a couple of them were accountants. Um, a couple of them were attorneys. Um, I think you know one or two were, were former police officers. Um, that was for the most part, a, a couple, two guys I think had been in kind of technology fields. Um, but that was really for the most part you know, what most people in my class had done. And so, you know, I said who I was, said what I used to do, and everyone sort of rolled their eyes at me. Um, and that was, I should have known from the beginning um, that that was an issue. Um, and they just couldn't believe that I had worked at the CIA. It they just couldn't, um, which was shocking to me given that they had to come to CIA to conduct my background investigation, but okay. Um, and I think to say it went sort of downhill from there um, would be an understatement. Um, you know, a gentleman in my class made advances towards me. Um, I was not interested. I mean, the academy is hard. I wasn't there to sort of, I guess, meet people really. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I nicely uh, turned him down, and I think he became this ringleader of really turning everyone in the class um, sort of against me. And I think. That behavior could have stopped um, if I had had better leadership. Um, the, my, my class supervisor, I guess, um, sort of played into it. Uh, and he would grill me constantly about the things that I did at the agency. And I kept saying to him, you know, you can ask my boss there. You can look at my file. And I think he just gave him pleasure to see me be like frustrated um, by it. And I, I detail a lot of the very um, specific things. Um, the FBI stuff portion was something that I wasn't sure that I wanted to put into the book um, because even though I know I didn't, go looking back on it, I know I did not bring it on myself, um, you sort of feel like a failure a little bit because you were the victim of that um, behavior. You know, what did I do wrong? And so for me, um, I chose, and I think this is part of what happened to me when I was bullied, I chose to almost, I guess, withdraw in a way. So I would study by myself for my tests. I would do all of my conditioning and PT training by myself. Um, I would eat all my meals by myself. Um, and so for me though, but that's where I took like my solace, um, if that makes any sense to, to viewers at all, that's kind of for me how I kept um, my sanity. Um, you know, just, I guess one example of sort of the, uh, bad behavior, um, is, you know, there was a gentleman in his class that his grandfather unfortunately passed away, um, during our, our, um, training. Um, and he, that day was able to, they gave him the time off. You're not allowed to take time off, but obviously they gave him the time off, um, to go to the funeral. Um, my grandfather passed away, uh, when I was in training and it's kind of hard for me to talk about. He never wanted me to be at the FBI, um, but he passed away um, unexpectedly when I was in training and they would not let me go um, to his funeral. Um, I don't know that I can ever like forgive them uh, for that. Their ultimatum was either um, go or quit. And I think they wanted me to quit. Um, but you know, I talked to my mom about it. I talked to my grandma about it and um, my grandfather wouldn't have wanted that. Um, and so I, I stayed, um, but I think that's just one example of sort of the um, mind games that they, they played with me. Um, it was the exact same situation, but they let this one person go and not, not myself. And so I think for me, uh, and a lot of people know that they've read my book, even my mom, it's like, I just don't understand how you didn't quit. <laughs> um, but I think that goes back to the sort of tenacity of, you know, how my mom was helping me walk. If, if I wasn't a quitter, and I think I kept telling myself in my head, um, once I get to my office, like whatever office I'm assigned to, 
um, things will get better. This is this is a small. This is a you know four and a half month, five month period of time. Um, you can do anything you know for that period of time, and so. Um, I graduated. I was the only woman in my class to not be recycled to another class, which means I didn't fail any portion of my class. Um, so maybe the poor treatment is what <laughs> makes me try harder. I don't know. Um, and so I was sent to the Los Angeles office to a smaller, what's called resident agency, which was the Orange County resident agency, um, which is great because it's actually exactly where I'm from. Um, and so for me, I w was not placed in the counterterrorism unit, which, you know, I wasn't really all that upset about it, but I don't know that I'll understand. Their reasoning was they valued my high clearance more than they valued my background in counterterrorism. So I was placed um, working a very, at the time, it's not anymore, a very sensitive Chinese counterintelligence case um, that they needed agents with higher clearances, which I had um, from the um, agency. And so, I, you know, it was, it, it was fun. I got to do dumpster dives in the backs of trash cans, you know, to, I found that kind of thing actually really interesting. I never thought it was beneath me. Um, but unfortunately, um, the sexual harassment um, just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I, I detail a lot of that to the point that one day uh, there was a comment made that, um, I actually had take, uh, begun living at home um, just because it was easier to save money and I just couldn't go back to work anymore um, after that, that comment was made. Um, and my dad, who really is a very, he's a psychologist, so he's very sort of calm. Um, I've never seen him get more upset than he did when I told him uh, what comment was made. And so he, I think I, I saw that moment as, okay, now it's time to be a teacher. I have gotten this background that I need. Um, and so I enrolled um, in a master's program in, in a college in Orange County. And um, I wanted to do as soon as possible so that I could get into the classroom and talk about things, I guess, kind of coming together. Um, the classroom that I was assigned to do my student teaching in was at my former high school in the same classroom as the teacher who made me want to be a high school history teacher, um, which was fascinating um, and it was the same high school that I went to and that I was bullied so badly at um, and in a way going back was very cathartic and I ended up working there for three years I, I became um, American history and um, government teacher there um, and it was it was a great experience sort of going back and in a way I guess sort of healing those wounds if that makes any sense um, but we moved um, I, I met my husband in California and uh, we decided to move to Dallas and so once we got here, um, I started teaching um, at the Hockaday School and I taught there for about 10 years. And one of the things that was really great there um, is that we had a lot of autonomy um, within our classrooms. Um, and so what I started to find uh, from girls is that they were very interested in my former career, not because of what they had seen you know, in TV or in the movies, because they were genuinely interested in the world. They wanted to know more about where these people came from, what these countries were like. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to start a class on espionage, counterterrorism, and diplomacy. And so I taught that for almost 10 years um, there. My class was always full uh, every year. Sometimes I'd have two sections of it. And um, I have a lot of former students who have gone on to careers um, in national security, you know, whether it's Homeland Security, FBI, CIA, State Department, policy, um, you know, uh, human rights attorneys, those kinds of things. Um, and it's been really kind of cool to see that. And I think I finally found in a weird way, my, my sort of my mission um, in life, um, women make up only about 19% of the workforce in national security. Um, I don't think that we're better than men or anything like that, but I do think that we bring different skill sets uh, to the table. I was reading an article recently um, from the head of Mossad, um, which is the Israeli version of the CIA, and he was talking about why some of his female case officers or spies are sometimes better, um, and that we bring a skill set that sometimes males just don't have, just in terms of listening, in terms of empathy, uh, those kinds of things, um, reading people, getting you know vibes, I guess, if you will, off of them. Um, and I think we bring different decision-making skills to the table, and our voice 
needs to be there. But I think what I was seeing from my students was that, oh, but those aren't jobs for, you know, feminine women. And I think people even see that when they see me is like, you did what? You know, they'll hear that I'm a teacher and they'll be, oh, that makes sense. But then I did the other two and it doesn't make sense to them. Um, and that can, that's very frustrating to me um, because I just sort of want to change the narrative and that it should make sense to see anyone in those positions, gender, race, religion, color, it should make sense. And so I just would like to try to change the narrative in that so that young girls don't see that these positions are positions for only males, that they're seeing women who are, who are in them. Um, and that's been, out of everything, probably the most sort of rewarding uh, thing for me. And I think that is why I ultimately wrote my book. Um, you know, it's been a bit since I've been at the CIA and the FBI, and I really didn't have a motivation or a reason uh, for writing my book earlier. But I think my students and really are what gave me the motivation. Um, there are a lot of books out there, but None of them, you know, I focus on it all. I talk about being in a sorority. I talk about, you know, the uh, development issues I had growing up. I talk about being very feminine, but I also talk about a lot of the gritty things that I did. And it was really interesting because it took me almost three years, which now I hear is not that long, but <laughs> it seems like a long time to sell the book um, because a lot of publishers either, they couldn't, they couldn't wrap their brains around both. Um, I had to take, they wanted me to take the feminine stuff out or they wanted me to take the teacher stuff out or they wanted, and I just, that wasn't who I was and that wasn't what this book was about. And so I had to make sure that there would be a publisher um, that wanted all of those things in. And so that's Macmillan, I guess, saw that um, and wanted all of that in, which is great because it's kind of presenting my whole self and that may resonate with some people and that may not resonate with some people um, and that's okay um, but I just felt like it was very important to sort of have all aspects um, of myself in there so that really is ultimately why I wrote the book was because I became a teacher um, it wasn't because I had had those careers which I know that sounds a little backwards um, but I think that that's that's ultimately um, sort of why I did what I did and why I decided that it was important at this time um, to sort of to sort of write that book. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to listen um, to my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope that if you choose to buy the book that you really enjoy the book. I am it was a really great experience to write. I had to write it in six months um, because we knew it had to go through the uh, CIA's vetting process so uh, wrote it very very quickly um, but i hope that you know if you choose to purchase it that you do really enjoy the book thank you tracy that was great we hope you all enjoyed it i'm sure we that you did um, i want everybody to come back next week and tune in at the same time same bat channel for one of our church members dana harkey and her review now seeing that i'm uh, recording this uh, today, I don't know the book, but we're sure it'll be good. And everybody have a great week. Try to stay as cool as you can. And we'll see you next week for Dana Harkey. Bye.